Hello and welcome to this Back Chat special. We're joined today by one of the men behind the newest rugby league club to hit the town, the Toronto Wolfpack. As far as some are concerned, it's the best thing that's happened to rugby league in many a decade. For others, they're just a shot in the dark that will disappear in a few years' time. Well, let's find out, shall we? From the man himself, the chief executive of the Toronto Wolfpack, Eric Perez. First of all, before we get to the, the nitty-gritty of, of how you became involved and why you became involved, why does Rugby League need the Toronto Wolfpack? Well, I don't know if it needs the Toronto Wolfpack, but it's certainly uh, a big boost for the game, I would say, as um, the key thing is opening new markets is the way you're going to expand and grow. You know, when you read uh, comments, especially from fans and uh, a lot of chief executives around the league, they'll say things like, how are we going to compete with the NRL, the player drain? How are we going to get more money into the sport? Some, some uh, owners who are a little bit flush with cash, they want to increase the salary cap. They want to get luxury players. Other owners are saying, no, no, let's not do that because we can't compete. It'll become too uneven. The truth is the only way to grow is to expand into other markets. And the North American market is quite lucrative. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that far away. It's pretty close. It took me five and a half hours to get here the last time I came in from Manchester. So it's not that far. And I think that we can offer uh, growth commercially as well as add a sexiness back into the game. You know, you've got football is huge. Everyone knows that. We, we can't really say that we're competing with football, but one thing we are competing with is the fact that football is considered to be sexy by the young people. Mm -hmm. I think a Toronto team in the RFL moving up the ranks is going to rejuvenate interest in younger fans and hopefully with the further expansion show them that, hey, listen, in North America we think rugby league is cool, so why don't you? Yeah. yeah. You can understand the cynicism though, can't you? Because rugby league has got a long tradition, not necessarily a fine tradition, but a long tradition of trying to expand yeah. and it's never been successful. So can you understand why people, well that, why there are doubters out there? Sure, I think that mostly comes from ignorance on the market. No disrespect to any of the other expansion areas. Uh, most of them are very small towns. Uh, you know, your, your, your Welsh expansions, uh, trying to do things in other areas uh, in the UK. London, yes, very big city. New However, Newcastle as well. Guess. Newcastle, but you know, fair enough. There are a lot of prejudices over here when it comes to rugby. So. You're, grow you're either growing up with league or you're growing up with union or you don't care about rugby. Mm -hmm. So if you're a league person, generally you're not going to be too big into union and vice versa. And that's very geographic in, a, I in this country. In Canada, those prejudices don't really exist. Fans just want exciting sport. And, you know, Toronto is a city of six million people. Around it, uh, within an hour radius, you've got 10 million people. We just passed Chicago to become the third biggest uh, metropolitan center in North America and for all those reasons and our enthusiasm for sport I just think it's a no-brainer mm. and, and I mean it's a long-term project though isn't it because enthusiasm for sport but not necessarily at the level that you're going to enter into if and when you get to the Super League that's when it might ignite but are, are Torontonians gonna buy in to third division rugby league and well we've already league? Uh, we've already got uh, over 3,000 season ticket uh, deposits in, and that's just individuals. So each one of those people you would want to say might get one or two or three or four tickets. So we might already be pretty close to sold out. Mm -hmm. We expect 10,000 fans every single game. For the Canadian national team, I ran, I started and actually ran uh, rugby league in Canada for the first five years up until last year. And uh, we were getting 7,000 on average per match for a level of rugby league that is infinitely lower than League One. Yeah. Uh, Super exciting though. That's what the, it's, it's sometimes taken for granted here how great rugby league is as a sport. It is the greatest game of all for a reason. It's super exciting. When you, when you grow up with it and you're used to it, you sometimes miss that, that magic that, that, that's there with every play. Canadians are just, we love it. It's the most Canadian sport that didn't come to Canada. Just the, the whole psyche of it, everything is just suited towards us. And, and, and these fans that are coming in to watch, are they coming in? with a, a kind of a, a knowledge of rugby and have to be educated about the two codes of rugby or are they just coming in to watch a new phenomenon that they know absolutely nothing about? They don't know much about the difference between league and union uh, so they're just they're coming to see rugby and they're finding this brand of rugby to be much more exciting. 
Mm. So, and, and the thing is, Canadian football, which is the precursor to American football, Canadian football directly comes from rugby league. I believe so, yeah. It came from immigrants who came from this part of the country, you know, Lancashire, Yorkshire, Cumbria, uh, of which there were many, came in the, the turn of the last century and brought their game to Canada. Now, in Canada, we upheld most of the uh, bans that were in place, uh, in the military, universities, and whatnot. So they couldn't bring it into Canada under the name of Rugby League or Northern Rugby Union, as it was called at the time. So what they did was they called it Canadian Rugby. And the, uh, the Canadian Football League, which is the fifth largest, uh, fifth highest domestic professional sports league in the world as far as average attendance, uh, that league actually was called the Canadian Rugby Football League up until 1958. Mm -hmm. And that's what the helmets and the pads and what you know as gridiron football. So rugby league is so easy to understand for people who are fans of gridiron football, which a lot of people are in North America, that it's a much more natural fit than rugby union. Rugby union, of course, has a huge player base in North America. However, uh, I mean, I played it for 10 years and I, don't, I still don't really know the rules. So it's really hard to understand for people and people in, in Canada are just a couple of sets and they just know what's going on mm -hmm. in rugby league. So it's more suited towards us. If, it's, if, if the hunger's there, if the desire to watch it is there, if, if people are like, wow, blown away when they see it, wh why, why has Rugby League not happened in North America before? Why well, is it, it taking time? I now? guess it just took me to start it. Uh, so but I others have tried. I mean, yeah. Milwaukee, we had the famous yeah. Wigan Warrington game in Milwaukee yeah. 20 years ago. I can't, I can't answer for what happens in the U.S., but in Canada I know that uh, there were significant efforts by Canadian football and Rugby Union to make sure that Rugby League never really got off the ground. There were some attempts... Uh, in the 40s, there was one in the Maritimes, uh, Halifax, ironically, which is where we're sat right now yeah. in West Yorkshire, but Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, they actually got uh, a competition going, and it was getting popular, but it was, it was sort of uh, sniped by, by Canadian football and rugby union. And it just took someone who was willing to give up everything, uh, work for nothing, and tirelessly, by the way, to make it happen and have a vision and a goal and stick to it, and that was me. Uh, Starting in 2010, and that was the w and that's what made it happen. And I just had the vision, and I was able to put it together. We were able to get a, our own uh, national television show rather quickly uh, after starting off and starting to get fans. I mean, our first match two months after I decided to start this, we already had 1,600 fans at our first match. So mm. it just shows the appetite for sport uh, in Canada. We've got lots to ask you about, lots mm. to talk about, how it's going to work, how teams over here are yeah. going to travel over there, et cetera, et cetera. We've got lots of time to talk, but just, I'm interested in you. Where did you, a Canadian, you're from Toronto originally. Yeah, yeah. Where did born you, raised, yeah. born and raised in Toronto, yeah. how did you fall in love with rugby league? Well, funny enough, the first time I saw rugby league, the first time I'd heard of rugby league was at, at the beginning of the internet era. I was on the BBC's uh, site in the 90s, uh, mid 90s and I saw that the the rugby league as a sort of a, a banner topic there was rugby union and rugby league so first of all I, I thought it was just rugby I didn't know that there was a union in the league at that time and I was a player and I asked my coach about it and I said hey what's this rugby league thing I see with all these teams there's Bradford and uh, St. Helens and I was uh, I was very curious about it and he said oh we don't talk about rugby league I don't really know what it is either, but we don't talk about it. That's all I know is we don't. So there was a dogma behind it. So I was like, hmm, that's interesting. And uh, being a human being, when someone tells you no, you just want to know more about it. You know what I mean? That's sort of the way it is. Then I had a girlfriend uh, who's from Gibraltar. So I would be in Gibraltar, and everyone in Gibraltar, who's anyone, has the illegal skybox at this time. This is the uh, early 2000s. And you would get the Spanish channels, you get the Sky channels. And I would watch Super League, on Sky in Gibraltar in like 2001, 2002, blown away, just saying, wow, this is incredible. But I was 21, 22 at the time, so, you know, this had other interests. Then I was living in Birmingham in 2010 and watching Sky, watching uh, Rugby League, just thinking, why is this not in Canada? And then something clicked in my head that I looked into the story, realized that there was that socioeconomic angle to it, uh, and I said, I've got to write this wrong. Canada is not about class structures. So we could have had this the greatest sport of all, which I thought after a few games, I just decided this is the greatest sport of all. And I went ahead and uh, gave up everything and pressed forward on uh, making this happen. Okay, you gave up everything. Everything, But yeah. But you've, you've got some money behind you? Oh, yeah, now. 
Yeah. But that took a long, that took five years I mean, I mean, of just, just let's go yeah. back to that though. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, an, that's astonishing. So you've, yeah. you've come across this sport, you're kind of half aware of it for four or five years, yeah. and, then, and then you just decide to give up everything. That's right. Yeah. To get this sport going in your yeah. country. Yeah. How are you living? How, what are you earning at the well, moment? What I, have you earned in the last few years? Well, I actually uh, just made some expenses. Didn't really earn any money. Just lived off of the money that I, that I had made before. Uh, to, to in, in the time that I was building up Canadian Rugby League. Um, anything I made, I just put right back into uh, development to make sure that we, were, we kept going. Because my goal was to convince the RFL, and this was my goal the second I saw it again in Birmingham, was to get a team for Toronto, convince the RFL that this is the way to go, and uh, press forward with that. So I had a, a goal. A lot of people over, over the years said, what are you doing? Uh, I mean, it's great you have your TV show, and, but like, you know, you're such a smart guy. Why are you doing this? You could be making so much money. You were making a lot of money and now you're not. Uh, but I had a vision, I had a goal, I knew what I was up to. And hard work, I guess, pays off. So what were you doing? What, what, when you say gave up everything, what, yeah. what is it that you I was gave? working in uh, advertising and had my own uh, advertising agency. Uh, yeah. And I was doing, uh, doing work with universities across uh, North America and uh, the UK. Wow. Yeah. So that's, that's quite a dream to have. And, and when you first approached the RFL, I mean, I mean how, d how did you get in touch with them? Who did you speak to and, and, and how convincing did you have to be? You had to be super convincing. Well, first, I, it started off, uh, you know, I would make contacts in the game coming over here. And uh, I got invited to, uh, there's a, the annual uh, parliamentary rugby league dinner yep. uh, at the House of Lords. And made a lot of really good contacts, including Richard Lewis, uh, Gary Hetherington, and some people there. And I sort of uh, kept in touch with them. And I would, I would come back over and film interviews for my, for my show with, uh, with players. And also have meetings about this, work on it from this side, work on it from back, uh, back home. And it sort of just piled up that way. To uh, to getting a meeting with uh, with the with the board the 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 RFL board and after many meetings with them uh, we had a meeting with the clubs and the clubs were uh, I think it was uh, 37 to one uh, the vote in favor of us joining. Who was the one? Do you know? I do, but I don't think I'm at liberty okay. to say. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I actually just found out yesterday who the one was, but I'm not at <laughs> liberty to say who it is. Uh, but um, yeah, so that's. So that's uh, that's how kind of how it started. It's in a nutshell, the story. But it, I mean, in between that, in between the lines are, you know, sleepless nights, wondering if I'm doing the right thing, still pressing forward, slowly gaining. You know, first first game we had 1,600 fans in 2010. Then the next year we averaged over 2,000. Then the next year over 3,000. Then over 5,000. Then over 7,000. And just building up like that. And this is this is who? Who are they watching? The Canadian national team. So right. I sort of made that my commercial focus. Okay. And they're playing at Jamaica, USA? Jamaica, USA. We've played Royal Air Force, Lebanon, uh, English Lions. Uh, so what we did was rugby union clubs weren't forthcoming. Actually, they would tell their players, you can't, if you play with the Canadian national side, you can't play rugby union first team anymore. So what I did was I started four clubs mm -hmm. uh, to and, and sort of cultivated the talent there. And those four clubs fed into the national team. Uh, that's how it that's how it all originally started. OK. Mm. And the, the international opponents were easy to to latch on to. No, they? no. Very difficult. Yeah. We had to pay every time Jamaica came to Canada, we had to pay for it. So that's like 20 grand a, a shot every time they'd come. The United States were the only ones who could come easily because they but there were even times when their federation was in turmoil, and I was pseudo running their federation, sourcing their their kits, making you know, getting them their transport to come over. Uh, so it's been it's been a road. Okay. Yeah. And you talk about rugby union. I mean, but how many how many Canadian football players have you have you attracted over to to play for Canada? And a few. Yeah. 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 But the most of them uh, have also had a rugby union background. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And did any of them know about rugby league before? Yeah, a lot of them knew about rugby league. At this point now, freedom of information is pretty uh, <laughs> easy to come by. It's not, it's not, there's no uh, embargo on the information like it was when I was 16, 17. So now it's, you know, you can just easily uh, see highlights. Uh, there was a time, actually, there was a time when, um, when there was a, a Super League uh, video podcast where you could watch highlights of the matches on iTunes. Right. So a lot of people would, were, were sort of being able to see it from there. But then our show sort of opened up the whole, because our show is national. 
across Canada, sort of opened up the door to... Is that to cable, internet? How, how does it go national? How does it go uh, national? Yeah, cable. cable. Yeah. Right. yeah, it's on cable. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's sort of opened up the door to say, oh, look, look how exciting this is. This is a really... And no... Dis I'm not trying to disparage Union or Canadian football. It's just I think rugby league is the most exciting code of any sport, not only football, just any type of sport you could possibly watch. So a lot of people agree, apparently. Well, we've got a lot more questions to ask you and a lot of more surfaces to scratch here. It's fascinating stuff, and we'll look forward to more of this just after the break. Well, welcome back to part two of this uh, Back Chat special. As we said before, we are joined today by Eric Perez, who's the chief executive of the Toronto Wolfpack. We heard in the first part about you give you gave everything up to make this dream happen, this dream of rugby league in Toronto happen. Now it's it's close to happening. How do you feel? Are you nervous about it or are you excited about it? Or? Uh, you know what? It's just we've got to crack on with the work. So there's no time to be nervous or excited. Uh, I mean, it, it, in, you know, if, if I had a minute to slow down and... Uh, and think about it, I'd be excited about it. Mm. But there's just so much work involved in starting up a club from scratch that I really haven't had time to reflect on, uh, on the situation. Uh, and for success, it has to be in Super League, doesn't it? I mean, you, you have to start for various reasons in the lower tier yeah. and work your way through. But from a success point of view, you have to be in Super League? Eventually. Like what you'll see is... And how long? How long before you're in that? Would you oh, say? listen, I, I'm not Nostradamus. But, okay, I'll say this. It will be successful from day one. Uh, Long-term success, though, uh, usually will come from winning and getting into Super League. That's the goal. That's the dream that we're selling to the Canadian people. Promotion relegation is something that is non-existent in North America. Uh, since uh, football has become super popular, premiership football and things like that, the idea of promotion relegation is just something that real Toronto sports fans and Canadian sports fans have sort of been yearning for. Mm. We've got some sports franchises in Toronto that are traditionally were, were, were the, some of the best teams, lately not doing so well because they literally they sell out all of their matches. They've got a 25, 30 year waiting list for season tickets. So they don't need to win because there's no consequences to losing. Yeah. So at the press conference when we launched a team, I really hit the point uh, home and a lot of people have sort of been latching onto it as there are consequences for losing in this sport and the reward for winning is much greater. Mm. So I think long-term success, yeah, we've got to get into Super League. Uh, but short-term, what you'll see is a super successful club from, from minute one. You're, let's just talk about the way you're going to run this then. You, you, you're going to have blocks of four, aren't you? From, from next year, you come into the competition, into that League One next year, and you're going to have four, four matches away on the, on the road over here in England, yeah. and then you go back to Canada. For, and you're paying for all, all, the, all the clubs. Yeah, we're paying where for all the clubs. Where does that travel? money come from? Where well, we've got great investors. Okay, we have a really so strong ownership group. Where did they come from? How did you convince them? Oh, that's a long story. That's a, that that took a lot of uh, hustling on the streets to uh, to you know get, look you know manipulating your sphere of influence, trying to speak to as many people as you can, and then finding the right fit, the right people who are a passionate about the sport and b have the funds to to fund it. So, so I mean, are, you, are these people who who are passionate already, or are, are they some are these people that you've sold rugby league to? Uh, well, they're actually the. Our main uh, investor, David Argyle, uh, is a rugby union guy traditionally, but he's from Australia and is a fan of rugby league. And after I brought him to the grand final, uh, he was just sold on it. So yeah, he's now he's super passionate about league. So he just likes rugby in general. Mm. Uh, it's, a, it's a big thing for him. So yeah, so it, it, it took a little bit of convincing on that side, but not much. I think 10 minutes into the meeting, he was already in uh, to the, the first meeting I had with him. But um, yeah, back to back to just uh, you know the funding the, the the teams to come over and whatnot. Also commercially, uh, with sponsorship, and we'll be the only team next year where all of our matches in the RFL, not just in, in our league, all of our matches will be televised. Yeah. Uh, actually, our matches will be televised on Premier Sports uh, in the UK, uh, and uh, and in Canada as well, so fully broadcast, and probably even more countries. So where's it going to in Canada? I mean, what kind of an audience are you getting? It's one thing putting it on television, but yeah. what kind of an audience do you oh, we'll, get? We'll be on the national uh, national sports broadcaster, so we'll have 
We'll put, we'll, I can't predict the numbers, but I'm sure we'll have great numbers. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and and th there is a, you've got an advantage, haven't you? In that every team that comes over to play you yeah. are flying out there on a Thursday yeah. and flying back on a Sunday. Every team's going to be jet lagged now. You're going to win every single home game. Well, there's no real jet lag coming that way. Uh, it's coming back when they've got to work the day after. Yeah, you know, really, uh, it's. I think to me, it's a lot harder to to jump on a coach and go from Barrow to uh, Hamel, uh, which is the same, which is about the same time as it is to fly comfortably on a plane over to Toronto. And then when you get there, you're in Toronto, so it's kind of a nice thing. Uh, playing in front of a huge crowd. Uh, we also have the disadvantage of ha having to play so many away games uh, on the trot, which is, which is a tough one. And also, we're paying for the whole thing too, just not mm. on the non-playing side. Just, uh, we're paying for, like the, the clubs don't have to pay a pound for any of the travel accommodations or anything like that. So we'll, yeah. be, we'll be sorting it all out. Yeah. Um, y y you're recruiting at the moment as well. Yeah. Uh, you've got names already signed up. Uh, yeah. Well, we you've got a coach and a... We've got, we've got, uh, we've got a, a great coaching staff. We've yeah. got Brian Noble, legend. Right. Paul Rowley, legend in the making. Right. Okay. Simon Finnegan, junior legend. Okay. <laughs> so we've got, we've got, we've got a, a, a fantastic coaching staff. Uh, we have signed some players, actually, and we'll be releasing those in the coming weeks. So, uh, and, and we'll be turning some heads with, with some of those signings. Yeah. Is, is, is there an unfairness in the fact that you're going to be spending quite a lot on them and, and other teams in that division can't afford to spend as much. Well, is there a salary, cra salary cap issue? Uh, no, there will be there will be no salary cap issue. Right. Yeah. So you can spend whatever you want. Is that um, no, no, no. You can spend. The, um, what I'm saying is, there's no salary cap breach that will be made. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So you're you're going to sign, but it's going to cost you a lot of money, isn't it? It'll cost money, uh, but in the new reality, which will be released soon. Uh, it won't be breaching any salary cap. Right, the yeah. new reality. Yeah. So it's like the next edition of Star Wars, then. Sort of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, what do you mean by that, the new reality? I, I'm actually not, uh, I can't be breaking any news about So this is an RFL, reality. you think yeah. the RFL are going to alter the rules so that everything will be fine as far as Toronto? Not just for us, but for, for a lot of the clubs that have been asking for it. Right. Uh, if you have promotion relegation between divisions, I'll, I'll, I'll give you this. For example, if you have uh, championship clubs trying to compete in those middle eights yeah. with, uh, with Super League clubs, if their salary cap is so much lower, mm -hmm. how are they supposed to compete with the likes of Leeds, Huddersfield, the clubs that are, they're going to be playing against this yeah. year? Yeah. There has to be a parity in the salary cap. So I think that that will be corrected uh, soon. Okay, yeah. so that's not an issue. Yeah. You're going to be spending a lot on players. You're going to be spending a lot on travel as well. Um, so relatively, yeah. Re re yeah. it's still a lot. Yeah, it's more. It, it, it might not be as far as Barrow to Hemel, but uh, yeah. I think that the playing costs are going to be more than the coach costs. Aren't yeah. They? So um, your investors, do they seek a return on a time scale, or, or are they? It's a long term play. To, yeah, right. it's a long term play for them. But actually, I don't envision that we'll be spending our own money on that. It'll right. all be sponsored. Right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's um, that's that's quite a deal. You, you, we, we, we've heard we've heard big stories before. Um, I mean, Brian Noble was involved at Salford when Marlon Kukash walked in, yeah. and, and and everybody got excited because this new character was in town. And what's going to happen four years later? Yeah. It's still the same old Salford. So, yeah. do you look at other clubs and and and, uh, and learn? I mean, Toulouse are in your position this year, aren't they? And yeah. they're doing quite well. So, do you look at other clubs and try and learn from them, or do you of feel course. that you've got your own blueprint? We've got our own blueprint, but it, obviously our blueprint's got to take, it's got to learn from, from uh, the, the positives and the negatives of things that have come before. Also, we're in a completely different market, uh, working under completely different parameters, so sort of it's a different kind of situation, but you can see what's worked. The thing is, the psyche in North America is so different that it's hard to uh, equate why people still don't go to Salford matches, uh, it was such a traditional club, mm. to why why our Canadian national team with zero budget, uh, you know, very little money, we were able to attract three times the crowd that Salford has been able to attract, you know, for the last, you know, bunch of years that I, that I was running it. So, mm. yeah. And, and do, uh, do you kind of pump the Toronto line or do you pump the Canadian line when you're back home? To when you're a Toronto team, possible? you're Canada's team. Yeah. For example, the NBA, Major League Baseball, there's, o there's only one team in Canada, that's Toronto, Toronto Blue Jays, yeah. Toronto Raptors. So that's seen as Toronto, huge, in Toronto, but as Canada's team around the entire country. So everyone will, will, will sort of get behind the Wolfpack as Canada's team. Yeah. Where did the name come from, by the way, the Wolfpack? That was a, that, listen, 
hours and days and months and weeks of deliberation. Started with a, a list, you know, longer than my arm, and uh, a lot of arguments and uh, late nights, sleepless nights, trying to figure out what, what, what the good name is. But yeah, Wolf Pack is great because wolves, indigenous to our, to our region, uh, rugby, it's got that sort of pack, that rugby league uh, sort of uh, innuendo yeah. in the name. And I think it's a, it's a strong name and, it, and, and you know, you've got to work as a team and, and uh, it's killer be killed sport. So uh, it's kind of perfect. Yeah. yeah. Now you're over here, uh, as you already mentioned, we're, we're, we're at Halifax at the moment. And yeah. you're not based here at this stadium, but you're based in the town of Halifax. What's, what's that all about? What are you Just me about? personally, I'm based here, but not, mm. not the club. No, no. Yeah. But, so what are, you, what are you up to? What's, what's that? Is that just about recruitment or what else is going on? Oh, listen, sponsorship meetings. There was a league meeting yesterday uh, of the League One, our first... Uh, meeting uh, with all the other clubs and a League One meeting in Manchester. There's a lot of stuff to be done, you know, it's sort of, when you're starting a team like this, it's kind of like starting two teams. You've got your Toronto side, mm -hmm. and then you've got the UK side. So you've got to make sure that both are running the way they need to be running, and as CEO, I've got to be in both places. So yeah. I imagine I'll be here a lot uh, over the coming years. And what's happening back in Canada? What's happening back in Toronto at the moment? So in Toronto, we're focusing on a lot of corporate sponsorship at this point. Uh, and uh, tickets, that's, that's the main thing, bringing in revenues. Yeah, you talk about the season tickets that have been sold, the season passes, do you call them? Yeah. Um, wh what kind of price are people paying for those? Uh, two, about 270 Canadian. 270 Canadian yeah. dollars, so, all right, so it's, it's a, a decent income stream that's... that's oh yeah, yeah, uh, it is, and, um, and that's, that'll be the lowest price season ticket you can get in, in Toronto, of, yeah. all the, of all the six or seven major teams we have. You're, you're in a stadium at the moment that I think has a capacity of 9,000. Yeah, 10,000. 10,000, yeah. 9,700. Um, would you be looking to, would you, would you think that once you reach Super League, you'd actually be playing in front of bigger crowds? Than that? Yeah, we have an aggressive 20-year uh, plan to uh, renovate the stadium. So, yeah, with, with success with the club, uh, will come renovations. Yeah. yeah. In these sleepless nights, do you ever think, I might be enough more than I can chew here? Is there any self-doubts at all? You, you know what, before, there were times when you're when you're not making any money and you you haven't been admitted into the RFL, you have the, you have your doubts, uh, but it's, you got to fight through those, and I have fought through them, and now there's no doubt this is going to be this is going to change the game. This yeah. is going to make rug this is going to put rugby league into a spotlight that it's never been before. All eyes will be on us. The NHL, the NBA, they've all talked to the NFL. They've all talked about expanding into the UK, for example, or into Europe. But none of them have really been able to put it together. There have been some, ex some exhibition matches at Wembley uh, for the NFL, but they haven't put it together. We are able to, without the fact that we're doing this, we're able to lay the blueprint down and lay the marker down to say, hey, listen, technology is here. Northern Hemisphere is just a hop, skip, and a jump away. Uh, why not, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the ultimate dream then, is it, is it I mean, we, we, when France first happened, uh, and it's a very different story because Catalan is a rugby league heartland. Two clubs merge yeah. and join the Super League. But the dream has always been, and the initial dream was to have two French teams in and, and build it up that way. Do you see um, a, a second Canadian team? Would you want a second Canadian team to be involved as well? Very much, yeah. Uh, actually, one of the main uh, tenets of this entire thing is that we continue to expand in North America. Montreal is, is, the, is the city that I want to bring in next, which mm -hmm. would be a huge rivalry. Uh, for us and for the French teams, because there's, no, speaking, there's no bigger rivalry than Quebec and France. Right. Yeah. So, so they're they're not friends. Let's put it to you that way. Right. So, uh, besides, you know, the fact that they speak the same language, that's all they have in common. There, right there. Uh, so, I think Montreal next, and then after that, let's get into the United States, Boston, New York, and uh, and, and go from there. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I'd also like to see a team in Dublin, as well. I think that would be. <laughs> we're, we're all of yeah. Barcelona. Yeah. Oh, we could we yeah. could pick all these hot spots yeah. around. But I mean, I, I, is that a generational thing? Is that is that is that doable in the next ten years, or are we talking a much a much longer distance? If I had to time? predict it, I would say within three to five years there'd be a Montreal team. Yeah. Yeah. But that depends on your success. That's right. Obviously. Yeah. So that means you need to be in Super League in three to five years. That would be great. Yeah. 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 The, the ultimate dream is to. Uh, lift the Super League trophy at Old Trafford, you know? Be the first non-English team to win the Super League trophy, the first non-English team to, to, to hoist the, the Challenge Cup at Wembley. Those are the, those are the goals. It's about winning Yeah. at uh, yeah. the end of the day, bringing glory to Toronto, bringing glory to the sport. Yeah, Catalan yeah. might beat you to that. Hey, listen. They might do it this year. 
they might. <laughs> and if they do, all, all you know, good on them. Yeah, they had they had an eleven year head start. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. I mean, it's a, it's a, it is an, an astonishing story. It really is an absolutely astonishing story. And I'm, I'm, I mean, just going back to to Birmingham when that when it kind of fermented. Yeah, has it surprised you how quickly you've got here, or or would you have expected to have been here a little quicker than you are? Funny enough, when when I was uh, when I decided I wanted to do this. I had, and I still have the notepad, and I wrote on a notepad a five-year plan at that time to get into Super League, because at that time there was no promotion relegation, right? It was the franchise system, yeah. so it was possible to go straight into Super League. So I actually wrote an ambitious five-year plan, uh, and it came true. So it took five years, and I and we were able to get into uh, the RFL. And would you have preferred to have had that available to you now to go straight into Super League? Is it, is it a bit of a frustration to have to work your Actually, no. I think it's, a, it, it's an advantage. Uh, it, it allows you to grow and build a squad. Let's not, let's not, uh, running a Super League uh, team is, is its own challenges. However, winning in the Super League is a much bigger challenge. Yeah. You've got to build it over years. You've got to build up your system. So I think we get the opportunity now to build up our system uh, and, and actually show Canadians the beauty of promotion relegation. I think the fact that there's a promotion relegation system in place now is to better for the sport. So I'm very happy to start in League One. There's a lot of big name cities in League One, uh, you know, Oxford, London, places mm -hmm. that people have heard of. Yeah, the Canadians will have right? so already first yeah. yeah. So people in Canada will know your Newcastles, your Londons, your Oxfords. So that's uh, South Wales, North Wales. Uh, these are all uh, exciting uh, mm -hmm. names for Canadians to, to be able to, to play and, 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 and support our team playing against. And not knowing rugby league, they might think that you're more successful than you are if you're beating Newcastle and beating yeah. Oxford because of the... I think it, it would be a success story to win League One either way, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, think, I think it is a big success to be able to do that. Some of these teams, some of the teams in League One are older than Canada. Yeah. Right? yeah. So yeah. it's, uh, it's, 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 it's going to be a tough division. We're not thinking we're going to roll through it by any means. We're going to give it our best. But uh, and I, and I, there is a, to, to me, it's a great honor to play against these teams uh, that have been around uh, f forever, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Eric Perez, the chief executive of the Toronto Wolfpack, is with us today on this Back Chat special. And we're back with, um, with a lot more of this fascinating story in just a few moments' time. So welcome back to part three of this Back Chat special. A special guest with us today, Eric Perez, the chief executive of the Toronto Wolfpack, the newest rugby league club in town who are going to be playing in League One in this country, coming to a town near you, or even your town, uh, in less than, well, it's, it's, it's not that far away. It's now, not that it? far, it, March. Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's, that's less than six months, is it? Yeah. Eight months, uh, nine months? Anyway, it's, yeah. it's not that far away, yeah. which is very exciting. Um, just going back to the resistance, you know, there is this kind of rugby league strength is also its weakness in this country, in that it it has a, a heartland in the north of England, and people want to expand beyond that heartland. But there's a lot of chippiness when that expansion takes place. So, what kind of a reaction are you expecting as a club when you go around these grounds? So yeah, no, I think uh, we'll we'll definitely have mixed reaction. Hopefully, some of the fans will be super uh, uh, negative and vicious towards us because. Hey, that's sports. You yeah. know what I mean? We want that. But I think a lot of people might, might say, you know what? It's really cool what these guys are doing. They've got the right attitude. And they're try they're all, all, you know, their intentions are to grow our game and make our game successful. And if we can be successful, we can definitely start competing with the NRL mm. uh, on, the, on the player drain. So I think we might actually end up becoming a lot of people's second team. Right. Uh, why not, right? You know, there, there's no reason to hate Toronto. Yeah. Uh, Unless they're beating you. Uh, and and you know, if you can't beat them, you join them, right? right? But uh, hopefully, uh, we can get, get a lot of fans in the UK. We'd love to have that and become sort of U the UK's second team. Yeah. Uh, depending on you know, what team you follow, you'll have your team. And then maybe some people won't even have a team. Maybe some people will get into rugby league because of this, because it's a cool concept and something different. So we'll expect a mixed reaction, and uh, that, that's the way it is. As far as uh, in reference to the chippy attitude in the North being you know, a detriment to the sport, I think uh, what you'll find is that's all. That's that's a hundred percent of strength. 
I think the without the Northern Heartland, what is what is rugby league in in, in this country, right? So you got to embrace that. And uh, you know, sometimes people need just to be shown, and pr uh, things need to be proven. There's a lot of talk, but if you can prove, I think you can win all these people over. People are generally uh, open-minded when they see uh, facts in front of them. When they when, when it's all talk, they've heard it all before. Mm. So let's let's show them by being a successful club, being commercially successful, being successful in the park, and growing the sport. I think that's what we're going to be able to do. Yeah, yeah. And you think so? The North Americanness adds 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 an extra element to it. Do you are you surprised? By a lack of coverage in this country at what you're trying to do? Uh, no, I think we've had great coverage right. uh, in, in the rugby league circles. But I think if you ask, in rugby league circles, yes, yeah. but I think if you ask the general sports fan about Toronto rugby league, they'd have no clue what was going on. I think right now that's more of a, an issue with where are the sports at in this country. Uh, it's very much niche uh, as far as if you're into rugby league, you're into it. If not, you, know, you don't really know what happened in the game last week between you know, Castleford and Salford. Mm. People won't know that in you know, let's say Birmingham or, or, or Brighton or somewhere like that. So I think that what we're going to be doing and how we're going to be changing the landscape is hopefully making it a sexier sport for those people who are traditionally into it. Uh, and, you know, maybe by the time the Montreal team rolls around, everybody will be buzzing about it all over the we're country. Al we're already talking about Montreal. Yeah. You've not even started Toronto yet. We're already talking about Montreal. Um, so let me take you to the scenario. Again, we've sat down with people who've, you know, fresh into clubs, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, you know, and, and, and everybody starts with great optimism, and quite rightly so. And then problems occur, because mm. they, they are going to occur. You right. are going to ha have problems. So let me take you a scenario. Halfway through the first season, it doesn't look like you're going to get promotion this year. You're losing more games than you're winning. You, do your backers get a little bit nervous at this point? Does the bubble Not at begin all. to pop Actually, little? I'm the one putting the pressure on getting promoted in the first year. Our backers are fine if it's a long-term project. Yeah. As long as we're commercially... Uh, hitting our goals, which mm. we will be, uh, that's that's the issue. How much do you have to earn? How much do you have to bring in to, to hit your goals? Uh, a couple million. A year? Yeah. That's a lot of money. Not and for North America. Right. Yeah. Are you doing that at the moment through, minimally through your, your season tickets? Yeah, easily. Easily. We'll You're doing two million on season? No, million? just easily with all, through all commercial endeavours, yeah. Right. Yeah. And your TV, I mean, we talk about the TV coverage that you, you, you're going to get, and it's national TV. Yeah. But, but when are you going to be noticed by national TV? Yeah. I mean, we, we've got sports in this country that go on national TV that the yeah. vast majority, 99% of the people don't see, don't, aren't aware of. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that's the case with Canada. When you're the first ever transatlantic professional sports team, yeah. you're going to have eyes on you. So I'll, that, that's something that will come with the territory. So mm. I think we'll get noticed from day one. Right. Yeah. But in terms of actual weekly coverage, mm -hmm. when do you think that will happen? To a, to a big audience. Day one. You're from not you're not going to get network TV coverage on yeah, day one, are you? from day one. From day one. That's what I said. We're broadcast so what, what channel? What channel are you going out on then? Well, there, we've got bids from a couple of, uh, of broadcasters. Yeah. But until we actually sign on the dotted line with one, I'd rather not put out any names. But right. uh, we we will be on a uh, national broadcaster. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's quite an achievement then. That's we're the first. We're the first team in the RFL where all the matches will be broadcast. Yeah. Uh, so it, we, we definitely are doing things differently than the other clubs. Right, yeah. right. Okay. And we also would like to build up coverage of League One. So what we're planning on doing is a League One uh, highlight show as well that will do, you know, a quick, uh, you know, match of the day style, boots and all style highlight show that, that focuses on uh, League One, mm. even if it's only a half an hour show, yeah. to get some of those, because we want to build up those clubs while we're in the division. Hopefully to get them a little bit more commercially viable as well. Right. Leave a positive mark on the division while we're in it. I mean, that's one of the concerns. We've got Toulouse climbing the scales at the moment. We've got Catalan in there at the moment. I mean, it is foreseeable, potentially, in three or four years' time that we've got Toulouse, Catalan and Toronto in, in Super League. And that, yeah. doesn't, doesn't, that doesn't sell to a British broadcaster necessarily, does yeah. it? So it's important that you... Do, does it? I think it does. Does it? It make, it, it's, it's bigger markets that you're in yeah. and increased interest. You know what I mean? So if there's bigger cities and and more uh, and it's got a more cosmopolitan feel, uh, it's kind of like the Champions League. People watch the Champions League. Uh, there's some teams from Poland in it. What would we have an interest in that or a team from Austria? But people watch it because it's that international flavor. So I think yeah, I think it'll just increase the profile of the sport. Yeah. I, th I think also you'll find more sp corporate sponsorship coming in uh, at the league level and at the club levels as they see okay, well there's eyeballs on this now in the United States, Canada, uh, France, UK, this is all of a sudden something a lot bigger. Mm. So this is how you grow the sport, is by growing the markets. Yeah. For yeah. example, 
the National Hockey League used to have six teams. For, for 30, 40 years, there were just six teams. Then they started, then they put a team in LA, a team in Oakland, they put a team in Vancouver, they started expanding it across North America, and that's when it picked up. Before that, guys were playing part-time. Mm. Now, guys are making five, six million dollars a year yeah. playing in that, and that's the way you do it, by expanding the market. Yeah, and, and you see Britain as the ultimate goal in terms of being involved in the competition over here. Or would you think that if you got to a certain level of success that Australia, the NRL, might be, be, a, be a better place to go? No, I think that, the, that we're, we'll, we'll keep it Northern Hemisphere. Yeah. It will build up uh, Super League and, and, and the RFL, and we'll build up the clubs, and we'll build up the, our system here so we can compete with them. And I think the goal is a Champions League-style format that runs concurrently with the season, where maybe the top four... Super League teams and the top four NRL teams are playing in a big tournament that is sort of like a, a Champions League mm. that is bringing more uh, commercial prosperity into the game and closer ties. I think what they're doing down there is great. Remember, there's only 25 million people in Australia. Yeah. Between just Canada and the UK alone, you're, you're scraping up to 80, 90 million people. Mm. Our, mar our, our economies are both bigger than Australia then there's no reason why, if we can't get popularity to our game to increase, there's no reason why we can't be bigger than the NRL. And mm -hmm. I think we will be. Mm. I think big, by the way. Yeah, yeah. well, I was going to yeah. say that. I'm going to yeah. pick that up. I mean, you think big, there's a lot of positives. There's a lot of this is going to happen, that's going to happen. What concerns you at the moment? What's at the back of your head? What's the, is there a nagging doubt there? Is there something that you think, this is an issue we have to get over? Uh, not, nothing that stands out, really. It's just uh, checking boxes and uh, doing what we need to do to be successful, which is what I've always done, and what this club will do, we'll strive for excellence in everything that we do. Yeah. I think, this is not a, to me this isn't something, that we're not, we are breaking the mold on this, but Boston versus LA is a huge rivalry in let's say basketball, and it's been a rivalry since the 60s. It's pretty much the same flight. What difference does it make if there's land underneath you, or if there's water underneath you at that point? It's, We've got to start looking at uh, in a more global uh, sphere. And I think actually with the uh, UK exiting the European Union, that uh, this country needs to make more or, or solidify ties a lot more with uh, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, United States, traditional countries that we have ties with. I think that's gonna, that, that will only serve to help in the cause. Mm. So I think that what you'll find is a lot of companies that want, want to start doing more business in North America now and this is sort of a microcosm of that and a good conduit for that kind of uh, for business to happen. So it's got other non-sporting implications as well. Yeah, we, we talked briefly about players, about your recruitment over here and about the players you've got playing for Canada at the moment. Yeah. Um, how many players, how many Canadian players, how many indigenous Canadian players would you want to have in your team when you kick off in 2017? As many as possible. How many is that then? I'm well, realistically, what listen, I mean, I, I, I'm not where the are they coming from? Where I'm not Brian and I'm not Paul, so I, can, I don't want to meddle in those areas. Uh, well, as many as possible that we can get. What we're going to be doing is a, as I mentioned, an eight city uh, tour yeah. of, of trials across Canada. It'll be televised. Uh, it'll be its own reality show, actually. We're working on a pretty massive television deal for that across North America and globally. It'll probably be aired in over 100 countries. Right. Uh, it'll be an IMG production. And uh, it'll, be a, it'll be a pretty big thing. And we're going to be searching for all that talent. So in North America, what I think another thing we bring to the game is a wealth of talent, a new uh, wealth of talent to tap into for the clubs here. So for example, in American and Canadian football, you have hundreds of thousands of high school players. You've got tens of thousands of university players. Billions of dollars are actually spent yearly on developing these guys. Then it spits out 0.01% of these guys will even get a look at the pros and of that even a fraction of that actually make professional so what you have is these super athletes that are conditioned with with uh, very similar skill sets that just need a little bit of upskilling to play rugby league and these guys are a lot of them are illiterate because they get you know fast track through school uh, academics are not a priority they're taking cake baking 101 just so they can get credits and keep playing for the football team end of the day they end up bagging groceries and you know, Windsor, Ontario, or Akron, Ohio, and their athletic career is over, but they've got all the potential. So we're gonna try and see if we can find some diamonds in the rough, unlock that potential, 
and uh, get some of that talent in there. Yeah, and, and by the time you make Super League, is it possible to have an entirely Canadian team, do you think, or is, is that a dream too far? Uh, first of all, I don't see it as a priority. Yeah. Uh, for example, the Toronto Raptors, super successful NBA team. They've been, they've been around for over 20 years. They've had three Canadian players the entire time. If you look into it, they are Canada's team. Huge Canadian flags on the world. It's not really the same kind of a priority here as it would be for the French teams who have a heritage with the game. Our point is we want to get as many Canadians playing as possible. And over time, you'll find more Canadians playing in the side. Yep. Another, another thing to note actually on this is that um, since the Raptors started uh, playing in basketball uh, in the NBA, there were very few basketball nets uh, around people's homes or whatnot in Toronto. Now there are tons. And actually in the last four or five years, I think there's been three number one draft picks in the NBA that were from Toronto. Yeah. So professional sport needs to stimulate grassroots growth. Well, that's, that's the NBA, and that's got millions, multi-millions of pounds behind it as an organization, which yeah. presumably it wouldn't have just been local promotion. They would have pumped in a lot of money. The RFL is, is, a, is, a, is a micro dot compared to that. So yeah. how much support do you require from the RFL at all? Would you, would you expect any support from it? Not RFL? much. You know, we're, we're here to lift the standards. So by, but we're going to be the ones who lift the standards for that. And then down the road, the RFL will have enough money to help in these new areas. But we're going to do it on our own. We're going to lift the standards. And really, the, the kid who decides to pick up a rugby ball he doesn't care how much money the RFL is putting into it. He's a Toronto Wolfpack fan. He wants to be like his heroes in the Toronto Wolfpack. That's why him and his mates are going to go out to the park and start throwing around the rugby ball instead of playing f uh, street hockey or baseball or basketball. We want to get them playing rugby, and the way to do that is to A, be in the league, check. Next, win and gain fans. Let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. And eventually get up to Super League and be one of the major teams of Toronto. And by the time we get into Super League, I think you'll see the landscape of our entire sport has changed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, and, and, and potentially, it's, it, it's massive for the game, isn't it? You, do you think this is the biggest thing since 1895 in terms of rugby league in this country? I'm going to say yes. Yeah? Yeah. I'm going to say it is the biggest thing. Besides yeah. 1895... If it, if it works. It will work. Right. And besides 1895 and Eddie Waring, yeah. this is the next biggest thing to happen uh, in rugby And league. summer rugby. Yeah, and summer That's, rugby. That's yeah. a huge thing too. Hey, not competing with premiership the entire time is great. Yeah. Being able to play when it's somewhat, I mean, you could call this summer, so let's call this summer. Uh, weather out there. By the way, our weather, 25 degrees, 30 degrees, really nice weather. So fans who are coming over from the UK to Toronto, they're getting a, a nice little holiday destination over the weekend too. So yeah, should yeah. be good. Okay. Well, we've, we, we're just about at the end. Um, which is a real shame because I'd love to sit down and talk to you all day. But just, just take me back to those, those first days. Who were your original heroes? My original yeah, heroes? Super League heroes. When you first switched on. Actually, my number one hero is Eddie Waring. Right. Yeah. Because... Right. Uh, well, he was before your time. Yeah, but uh, I, I watched uh, a couple of documentaries about him. Yeah. And a lot of people don't know this, but he actually uh, ran Dewsbury, yeah. was a really successful coach. Yeah. Leeds yeah. as well. Uh, and then had the drive and the motivation to just keep contacting the BBC and saying, hey, listen, I want to be your commentator. I want to be the guy that, that gets the word out. And he, he just accomplished his goals and made the most out of it. Another one is Gary Hetherington. Uh, he's a mentor of mine. Just the way what he's been able to do in this game, sort of unprecedented. So if, we, if I could be even half as successful as he's been in this game, then I'm doing all right. Yeah. And, and, and you're, you're back in the plane, when you were watching the players, who, who, yeah. who were the ones who stood out for you? Who oh, I mean, I, I liked, uh, when I started watching, it was Bradford and Leeds were, were the main two sides. Uh, Brian McDermott, just the, the steal, you know, just the, the way he would go into a tackle. Uh, also, Jamie Peacock, uh, Adrian Morley. I like, I like the guys who, who get stuck in and, uh, and make it a bit rough. Yeah, yeah. the tough guys. And yeah. is, that, is, that what, is that what's going to sell it, ultimately, to Canada? The toughness of the sport. Look, rugby league is ice hockey on a field with a ball instead of a, 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 with a stick and a puck. The, sp the psyche of the players, the mentality uh, is just, they're the same. They're one and the same. So I think the sport will sell itself because all these elements, you know, it's got the finesse, it's got the speed, it's got the hard hits, a little bit of biff every once in a while, never hurt anybody. All these things, well, I guess someone would get hurt from yeah, that, but... Yeah. But, but you know what I mean? Some of the, all these things are, are a recipe for success 
in Canada. So I'm just going to be a conduit to, to hopefully make rugby league one of the most popular sports in Canada. By the time I think I'm, I'm, I'm done with, the, with it and, and, I, and I shuffle off, I hope rugby league is Canada's summer sport. That's, that's sort of the goal. Well, we wish you the best of luck. Well, thank you. Eric Perez, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Appreciate it.